Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, webinar on the Analyze Bus Open Data Service. Uh, we're joined today by Ito, who are providing the uh, service on behalf of the Department of Transport. I'm Tim Rivett from Artig Inform, and I'm your host for this afternoon. We are recording this session and we'll make it available to you afterwards um, and uh, please do feel free to use the chat to ask questions as we go along. Uh, we have a team from ITO with us and so we'll do our best to answer questions in the chat as we go along but we will have opportunity for a, for a Q&A and to uh, pick up some of the questions that, that we've not been able to answer in the chat as we've gone along. Um, so yeah, please feel free to use the chat. Um, so for those of you that are new to Artig, uh, we're a membership body that uh, focuses on public transport technology and how to make the best use of that. We have members that range from the DFT to local authorities, uh, bus operators and the whole supply chain for public transport technology. And we run uh, educational events like this, uh, work day workshops, create and help um, uh, develop technical standards in both the UK, but also in Europe and wider and uh, create best practice guidance uh, on public transport technology. Um, so that's a quick about us. Um, you've come though this afternoon to um, find out about the Analyze Bus Open Data Service. Uh, and as I said earlier, we're joined by Ito, who uh, provide the service for the DFT and yourselves. Um, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Dan, I think, to uh, to do the uh, most of the work this afternoon. Welcome, thanks, um, Dan. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Um, so, yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining this afternoon. Um, and today we're going to run you through an introduction to the Analyze Bus Open Data Service. So. This is aimed at some people who who may have used the service a bit and want, want some more information and also anybody who, who's yet to use the service and wants to find out a bit more about what it is about. Um, so uh, I work for ETO. My, my name is Dan Jones. I'm head of product management here um, and we are the DFT's tech partner for Analyze Bus Open Data. I'm joined on the call um, by a few ETO colleagues uh, and I'd like to ask Faisal if you could just introduce yourself quickly. Thanks Dan. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Faisal Ahmed. I'm the customer success executive at ETO. Uh, I've been at ETO now for about three months. Um, so I look after our customers uh, such as DFT uh, and the like, uh, building that relationship with them um, and our other customers. Uh, over to you, Liam. Afternoon, everyone. Yeah, Liam Daniels, one of the product managers at Ito World. Um, I work closely with Dan uh, and work within the analytics space within Ito World, uh, making sure we're setting a, a roadmap and, and direction uh, for our products. Um, yep, yeah, that's me. Thank you, Pace. Um, so yeah, today we're going to run through an intro to to analyze bus open data, which we sometimes refer to as ABOD. Um, We'll start with a background on on BODS itself um, and where it sort of where analyzed bus open data fits within that. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about what you can get out of the service, such as on time performance reporting, excess wait times, uh, monitoring feeds and so on. Um, and we'll finish with, with answering questions. So as Tim said, as we go along, please post as many questions as you want as you can into the chat. Um, if we can answer them, um, if one of my colleagues can answer them, they, they will. Otherwise, we'll return to them at the end um, and try and get those answered. Um, so to start with, what is the Bus Open Data Service before we get to ABOD? Um, so BODS, as we re refer to it, is mainly about publishing and consuming um, bus data. So on over on the left here, we have data producers. In this case, it's the operators um, and their publishing schedules vehicle location information um, and fares information as well. 
uh, in three different um, data formats. They publish that onto the service and then it becomes available for data consumers to consume. Um, and those outputs are um, different data sets in, in the raw format as they were provided um, and also um, in some different formats such as bulk downloading that data using an API to interact with it and also some data formats such as GTFS which are, which are easy to sort of use in journey planner applications. Um, so where does ABLED fit into this? So behind the scenes we have uh, what we call an integrated transit model and a real-time matching we won't go into too much detail on that, but essentially we aggregate all of the data together on BODS. We match the schedule information and the real time information together. Um, and then we archive that information down into um, what we call a data warehouse. That then provides us with the features that we see on analyzed bus open data. So things like feed monitoring, um, schedule adherence, journey time analysis, vehicle journeys and so on. Um, so that's a very quick intro to, to BODS and, and how ABOD fits into that. Um, so what are the goals for Analyze Bus Open Data? So it's, it's part of DFT's ongoing investment in bus services. And it's there to help support the national bus strategy, enhance partnerships, bus service, bus service improvement plans, reporting and so on. Um, so we really want to help um, the government, local authorities and bus operators to perform um, bus data analysis in faster ways and easier ways. Uh, produce more accurate and detailed performance reports, um, help with collaboration between different organisations um, and also to identify network improvement opportunities. Um, all of this um, can eventually help inform transport policy, um, compliance monitoring across the industry and so on. So these are goals, things that we're working towards. Some of these things we're, we're further along with others, um, but that's what we hope to get out of the Analyzed Bus Open Data Service. Um, so who can use the service? Uh, it's available to operators, to local authorities, DFT, DVSA and, and OTC. Um, so all, that's, a, that's a lot of different users. There's a lot of data there, um, but users generally only have access to national operator codes. That's essentially operating companies that are relevant to them. Um, so if you are just a single operator, you'll, you'll have access just a single that single operator code. If you're a local authority, you'll probably have access to you know, 20, 10 or 20 different operators perhaps. Um, and that allows a consistent view between um, all of these operators, local authorities, DFT and DVSA. Everyone's viewing the same data. It's all based on the same information um, when you're looking at these reports. And I guess most importantly, it's free to use. So operators, local authorities can all obtain access to this information and this data, um, perhaps in some cases where they couldn't before, and they can do that for free. Um, so. What are the requirements to obtain analysis? So the first one is to provide real time data. So this is going to tell us what is happening right now. So that's going to give us the position of buses. Um, and we get these updates every 20 to 30 seconds from a vehicle location feed once it's provided to BODS. Um, tells us exactly where the vehicle is, when it was there, um, and also some other information such as the trip that it was running, the line that it was on and, and so on. So that's the first requirement. The second requirement is that we have scheduled data. So this is telling us what is supposed to happen. Um, and again, this is the operator data that's published on the bus open data service. It's trans exchange. Um, and once we've matched those two together, um, we can essentially see the differences between what actually happened and what was supposed to happen. Um, and finally, the what we call the network topology, essentially all of the stops, the stations, we take care of that behind the scenes. It's helpful if you provide shapes data within your scheduled data, but the relationship between all these stops um, is handled by ABOD itself. Um, so as long as we, as long as the bus open data service receives compliant data for those two um, data feeds, then the system's going to create on-time performance analysis. Um, I guess it's worth worth emphasizing here that the operators, they're not the ones supplying the analysis. It's being created by the service automatically um, based on the two data sets that are being provided to bots there. Um, and the operator doesn't need to sign up or opt in for that analysis to be created. So if you're new to the service and you sign up and you haven't been in it before, there will already be data in there, provided you've been uh, supplying these feeds going back quite some time now, probably a year or more. Um, it, it's worth kind of focusing on the last point here that if if that underlying data that's being provided to bods isn't compliant or it's it's of, of poor quality 
the resulting analysis is not going to be complete. So it's something we really want to um, emphasize. And over the following series of webinars, we'll be providing some more information about how, how this can be done well. Um, so some common issues that we see with the source data, just to kind of run through these. Um, the first one being that timetable or AVL, AVL data so it's not being published to BODS at all, or it's not compliant. So that's kind of a very basic step of if the data isn't there, you're not going to see any data when you log into ABOD. Um, sometimes the timetable data is being provided, but perhaps the journeys within um, the timetables have expired. Um, and also the third one there, if we have these two data sets, perhaps the matching between them um, is low. And again, in later webinars, we'll talk about exactly how we match this data up and how we can improve a low matching score um, to increase the completeness of the data we see in ABOD. Um, number four, if the frequency um, of the, or the availability of GPS data from the ticket machine is poor, we're not going to be able to produce um, complete analysis. And also if the accuracy of, of the exact locations is poor again, for example, you might see on some vehicle journeys, vehicles moving through fields and so on. Um, that's going to result in incomplete and, and potentially inaccurate analysis as well. So it's it's worth keeping an eye on these. If you see something that's perhaps not quite right in ABOD to, to think through um, these examples and if there's anywhere that, that can be improved to improve the quality of the analysis. Um, so moving on to what can be done with um, analyzed bus open data. Um, so the first um, is on time performance reporting. Um, and so this is something that can be used if perhaps you want to, as an operator, you want to look at uh, your schedules, see if there's any improvements you could make to your schedules to make them more reflective of, of what's achievable on the road. Um, but also if you're looking as a local authority, perhaps at particular areas of, of the road network that might need improvement, you can start to use this on time performance data um, as evidence for that. Um, so what do we consider to be on time? Um, so on time in, in ABOD follows the traffic commissioner's def definition. So that's anything between one minute early and five minutes and 59 seconds late when departing the stop. Um, we base the on time performance data on departures only. So um, that means we don't include arrivals. It's quite often the final stop you'll see is not included because we only uh, we only kind of arrive at that stop and we don't depart it. Um, Sometimes you can see in different systems, if you have access to different systems with similar data, um, it might look different. And this could be because there are some different definitions being used um, in order to define what on time performance is. Um, so with an ABOD, we give you some tools to sort of temporarily adjust this to see um, what the data may look like with some slightly different definitions. As an example, rather than one minute early, you might have a system that's using one minute 59 seconds to define early. So you can play around with that and see um, what the data looks like. Um, and our default setting is to report on timing points only. So whenever you load up an on-time performance report, it'll already be selecting timing points only. However, you are able to toggle to see on-time performance at every single stop on the route if, if you need to. Um, and so here are just some screenshots of, of that um, kind of comparison of different on time performance definitions. So I'll show you, show you this in a bit. Um, I'll demo it to you. Um, but essentially here we're seeing uh, what the picture looks like with the default settings of one minute early up to six minutes late. You can simply input two minutes early and five minutes late as an example of a different definition you might be using. Um, and you can see um, down below the default uh, settings the default scores with this definition and then the comparison with the updated definition. So, for example, in the bottom right there, we can see the early score with the default definitions was 3.5%. Using two minutes early, that's dropped to 0.6%. Um, so it's something to keep in mind if you're seeing different systems with different um, uh, data scores in. So very simply, creating an on-time performance report and again, I'll run through this as a demo um, in a few minutes. Uh, so you just need to find the operator you're looking for. So if you have access to more than one national operator code, you'll have a list. Search through that list, find the operator that you're interested in. Um, adjust the time period and filters you require. So you can look at essentially any time period historically. You choose longer time periods, they're probably going to take quite a while to load. Um, but again, you can sort of use the date picker to, to look at any historical period where we've been collecting data for you. 
Um, and you can also add filters. So on the right here, um, you can see a screenshot um, with filters for days of the week. So perhaps if you've got a long time period and you want to just look at the, the weekdays, you can um, take out Saturdays and Sundays, um, or you can change the time range, for example. If you just want to look at performance um, in the rush hour in the morning or the evening, you can um, filter the data just to focus on those periods as well. Um, and it's important that, that you know that we can report at an operator level, we can drill down to the line level, and, and finally, sort of the most granular level, we can look at individual stops as well. Um, so you can create reports and, and download and export data for, for any of those levels of granularity. Um, if you want to share this data or export it, um, you can invite anybody within your organisation to ABOD. Um, again, I'll, at the end of the webinar, I'll show you how to do this. Um, and you can then share the URL of every report that you're creating. The URL becomes a sort of unique URL for that, and you can share that URL with somebody else in your organisation. When they click it and open it, it'll have the same report that you're looking at. Um, for those who, who aren't in your organisation or don't have access to ABOD, most things can be exported by CSV on the page, um, or you could simply print screen, export as PDF the page you're looking at if you want to share it um, outside your organisation or with others. So that's on-time performance reporting. Um, quickly move on to excess wait times. Um, so it's worth a mention that within the service, on-time performance reporting is, is for what we call infrequent services. However, we have frequent services. So this is any services that are um, six or more times per hour. Um, and we use a different metric for performance here called excess wait times. So what does that mean as a passenger? It's the average time uh, waiting over and above what I'd expect if the service ran perfectly to schedule, for example, every 10 minutes, every five minutes and so on. So we first calculate the average actual wait time for a service that we've recorded, and then we subtract the average scheduled wait time. Um, again, for example, every 10 minutes, every five minutes, and that gives us a report on excess wait time. Um, and it's worth remembering that services often don't run frequently throughout the entire day. So ABOD reports on particular hours where we have observed that that service is running uh, six or more times in the hour. So moving, moving away from uh, on-time performance reporting and excess wait times, um, you're also able to set up corridors within the service and measure speeds and journey times along these corridors. So why might you want to, to do this? So if you're a local authority, for example, uh, you may be uh, perhaps thinking about things like traffic signal priority, uh, bus lanes, or you may just um, have kind of uh, passenger feedback that journeys are taking too long along particular roads. Um, so within the system, you can set up a corridor. Um, you do this by searching for a stop um, to start off the corridor creation process. You select that first stop, name the corridor, and ABOD will then guide you through selecting subsequent stops uh, that make a valid corridor. And normally this is along a road that's a, a busy road with many services running down it. Um, and once you've done that, that will be saved into the system. You can always come back and see, see these corridors at any time. Um, and that will allow you to port, report on journey times as well as speeds. Um, so you can see here, for example, the total number of um, transits for which we have data moving along this corridor, the average journey time um, for, for a transit through this corridor, the average speed, and also the number of different services. Again, I'll run through this in more detail um, when I demo this to you. Um, and you can also view every single vehicle journey um, that we have recorded information for. So the last few sections I've just spoken over are sort of aggregated data reports. Um, you may want to dive into a single instance of a, of a vehicle journey. Um, and essentially, we, you can search for a specific journey on a specific day, um, and you can see exactly where that journey went and when. Can you review, review every GPS um, location update that we've got? Um, and you can essentially see where that vehicle went. So if you perhaps had a complaint that the vehicle didn't go by the route that it was expected to go to, you can investigate that. Um, perhaps if there was disruption, you can see what, which sort of routes the vehicles took around the disruption. But also if you want to dive into particular on-time performance metrics at each stop, you can see how the service has sort of um, determined the departure time based on the GPS signals that we've received around that stop. Um, 
and I will run through this in a second as well when I demo. Um, but again, you can see the exact track of where this vehicle went, uh, which is what you're seeing in, on the map there. Um, and also at each stop, whether it departed on time early or late, which is signified by the different colors that you see there. Um, and so finally, that's all the performance reporting, um, but you're also able to monitor the feeds that we're we're getting into the system. Um, and so normally this this is something that you might look at if perhaps the analysis that you're seeing isn't complete, it's missing data. Um, and what you can use the feed monitoring section for is to view whether ABOD has access right now to the feeds um, required to produce the performance reports within the service. So again, you can search by national operator code. You can see the activity from the feed that day um, and even up to the last few minutes. And you can see how many of the journeys that we um, are seeing in the schedules, how many we can match to that, to those vehicle location updates. And, and you can do that for the last 90 days. Um, so here's some examples of what you might see. You can see that the feed status is active in that left image. The current number of vehicles uh, we're seeing in the feed is four. We're expecting four. That's great. We're getting all the data we need for this operator. Um, however, sometimes um, you will see gaps. Um, so on this last 24 hour image, there's a dark line that represents what we were expecting. And then the filled up bar is, is what we actually saw. Sometimes you'll see gaps um, and that that is essentially because we couldn't match um, a particular trip that we were expecting to see, and that will result in some incomplete data in the on-time performance reporting. Some of that is unavoidable, um, might genuinely have been cancelled services. Some of it may be to do with the elements of data that we we're unable to match between those two feeds. Um, and as I mentioned in, in future webinars, we're going to run through that in some more detail and explain how that can be improved if you're seeing problems with that. Um, so I'm going to quickly change my screen and, and work through some examples. So probably the most common uses we see with ABOD, um, and I encourage everyone to go and take a look at this um, uh, three here. So on time performance reporting, um, corridor pinch point analysis and also vehicle journey replay. Um, so I'm going to run through what this looks like within the service now um, and then also encourage everyone to go, go and have a look at this themselves and have a play around. Um, So when you log in to ABOD, you'll see this screen here. Um, so this is a dashboard of a sort of random selection of operators so don't focus too much on the on the information on the screen here. Um, but it's going to tell you for the operators that are relevant to you what the on time performance is in terms of on time early and late. And also in the top right, the current number of vehicles we're seeing in the data feed versus the expected number. And if any feeds are sort of inactive or down at the moment, um, you'll see some red crosses and the names of those operators as well. Um, if you want to do some on-time performance reporting, you jump into this on-time performance section here. Um, and when you jump in, you'll see aggregated uh, on-time performance statistics for all of the operators that you have access to, if you have access to multiple operators. And again, here you could change the time period that you want to look at um, by clicking this date picker. You can look at any time period you like. Um, and there are some presets of things like looking at the last seven days, the last 28 days, the last month, and so on. Um, as I mentioned before, the default here is to look at timing points only, um, but you can switch to look at all the stops if you wish. Um, but obviously the, the performance score is going to be slightly different there. Um, if you um, have access to sort of multiple different admin areas or localities, uh, you may want to just narrow that down to look at one particular area. You can look through all the admin areas you have access to here. You can click on that if you have multiple, that will narrow it down. For example, if you click on Bedford here, you'd only see um, performance for data that's within Bedford. Um, you can see all the operators down below uh, that you have access to. You can search this table um, by uh, the names of the operators and you can click in to one of these operators to see the performance for that operator. Once you click in, um, you'll be able to, again, choose any time period you like um, and then see the timeline of performance over that time period for this particular operator. Um, so you can see the on-time performance reporting over the time. See hover at different days and see what the on-time early and late performance was for that operator. Um, 
And down below, you can see the aggregated performance scores for this time range, including um, incomplete data. So this is uh, stops that we weren't able to kind of accurately and confidently match in this data set. So there'll probably always be a bit of missing data, but generally you want to see this down below 10%. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you're able to compare thresholds. Um, so again, using that example I used earlier, perhaps you define early as two minutes um, and late as five minutes. You can see some comparisons to how this data would look on the right here if you use those definitions instead of the standard AVOD definitions. And you can take that if you use another system with those definitions and compare that to that system if you wish. Um, other charts that we make available um, is a distribution of data. So if you want to see how um, the distribution is against the number of stops we're seeing for particular delays, just loads. Um, potentially have to come back to this if I'm having an issue here. Ah, here you go. Um, so this will give you a distribution and it will tell you for each sort of minute bin how many stops we're seeing um, for that delay. Um, so you can see here 1,800 stops, uh, zero minutes. And you can go out here and say we're seeing 57 stops that were plus eight minutes and so on. It gives you a bit more information about how that delay is spread out. Um, you can also see different times of day. So again, are there any particular times of day that perform better than others? Um, obviously the evening here, we've got great performance, even up to 100% on-time performance, um, but early in the morning, um, struggling a bit with some some late performance. So that's going to tell you which which times of day you might want to focus on if you're going to make changes to schedules or or the network and so on. Um, and also days of the week. Um, if you've kind of selected a long time period, perhaps a month or more, you'll be able to see which particular days um, are performing better than others as well. Again, that will allow you to focus in on particular days where there may be issues. Um, down below, you'll see every line for an operator broken out and again, all of the metrics for this. So the average delay, um, the on time scores. So you can see lines that have particularly good on time performance by quickly filtering and, and changing, uh, sorry, sorting that uh, data table. Um, and it's important to mention if you want to export this data out, you can click this export data button and that's going to bring you out a CSV um, that you can then use elsewhere as well. Um, as I mentioned before, you can drill down so you can click on one of these services um, and that's going to give you again all of the same metrics and charts, but we will add in a map at this point as well. Um, so now you'll be able to see exactly where all the stops are, what the route looks like on a map um, and we'll give each stop a color. So green for good on time performance, yellow for OK and red for, for not so good. Um, and this is a quite quite a small route uh, to keep it simple, um, but you can see here uh, for this time range, the 12th to the 18th of January, there were two stops with that sort of middle 60 to 80 percent on time performance. Um, again, you could refine this. So I've just did an example earlier where I refined the report um, to just include the evening sort of rush hour period, and you can see how that changes the performance on the map. So no longer are these stops yellow over here, the yellow stops are over here. So you can use this sort of map with the filtering and the refining to sort of see how the performance uh, geographically changes across across the day if you're looking at solving some some specific problems. Um, and down below, all of the stops will be listed. You can sort those stops, you can filter those stops. Um, and again, you can export that out as a CSV if you want to take this data and use it um, perhaps in another system um, or to kind of share it externally. So that's on time performance reporting, the first example. Second example is corridors. So if you click in the left to the corridors section, you'll see a list of corridors that will exist within your organization. All of these are I or someone else in my organization have created previously. You'll start off with nothing in this list and you'll you'll click on create a new corridor, give that corridor a memorable name um, and then start to search for stops. You can search by location or you can search by specific stop names. So if you just type in a stop name there, we're going to search for all the stops that match those. Um, and if you know roughly where it is, you can zoom into the map um, and then click on the stop that you require. Once you click on that first stop, the system's going to go through and find any other stops that are on 
um, schedule data that we've been provided. Um, so in this case, there's only one stop that you can go to from this stop, which is here. Um, and you can cycle through this adding stops um, and continue to do so until you've built up the corridor that you want to measure um, performance over. So you keep doing that. Once you click finish, this will be saved into the system, into that list that I showed you just a second ago. And you can select that in the future if you want to want to view the uh, performance along that corridor. Um, so this is what a corridor looks like once you've created it. Um, again, you can uh, select any time period you want. Um, and you'll see this kind of blue line here, which uh, shows us what the corridor looks like. Um, so each stop along here, you'll be able to hover over and see the name of. Um, and you'll also be able to see the distances between these stops in the corridor. Um, if there's a dashed line here or this little star, essentially what we're saying is we're when we're showing you any speed metrics, we're doing it using just straight line distances. And this is probably because we don't have shapes data within the files that we've been provided on the bus open data service. So uh, that can be corrected by just providing us with the shapes data. Um, and again, on the visual representation on the map here, you can see these dashed lines just to let you know that that is, is the case rather than um, following the shapes data that we have. Um, as I mentioned before, give you how many uh, vehicles we've seen move along this corridor, so 816, how many we're missing, so 64 here. Again, that might be because services were cancelled, but probably more likely to be because we couldn't match um, a trip um, to the schedule. That gives the average journey time along this corridor and the average speed as well. Um, and down below, you can see some quite useful charts that will tell you um, um, average speeds, maximum, minimum speeds on particular days. Um, so here on Wednesday, you can see the maximum speed was 20 miles per hour, the minimum was seven miles per hour, and the, and the average was 10. Um, and you can quickly spot which um, days are, are performing better than others. And if you've got a particularly um, long period of time, uh, you can aggregate that to hours of the day. Um, so you can see at five to six in the morning, you obviously have the best um, performance. <laughs> Um, in the middle of the day, 3 to 4 p.m., you've got quite a narrow spread of data, but also a low average speed. So that can help you indicate um, what times of day you're struggling along this corridor. Um, this little hide outliers button, if you're seeing some strange numbers at the extreme, sometimes um, you might see that you can click to hide outliers and that will sort of visually remove any any strange data at, at the end um, of those candlestick charts. Um, so what's one useful application of this? So you could click on um, perhaps different um, segments of this. So you can see the average speed across this whole corridor is 10 miles per hour. If you click on an individual segment, the report will load up again. So I'll just this one earlier. So between the stadium and Arnold Street, we, we're just looking at this one particular stop to stop segment and we can see the average speed along here. The map is here, it's 19 miles an hour. Um, now, that's pretty good, um, but we, we're looking for somewhere that's not performing so well. Um, if I choose this stop-to-stop -stop segment between Gladstone Street and Hull Royal Infirmary, you can see that actually the average speed's dropped to seven miles per hour. So you're starting to see exactly where um, you're seeing poor performance. And again, you can look at this at different times of day, different date ranges to see um, exactly when you're getting that poor performance as well. Um, and you can see on the map, it's this segment here, um, sort of busy crossroads here. You can also go to satellite view if you're not sure what's there. Obviously, there's a hospital here. Um, and you can see there's quite a busy interchange. Even the, the image that's used on the satellite picture um, has quite a lot of cars queued up in both directions. Um, so you might use this information to start to think, is there anything we could do to improve this? Perhaps changing the schedules, perhaps um, inputting tra traffic signal priority and so on. Um, Finally, down below, if you've got a very busy corridor, you're going to have a lot of different services running along this. And so you might want to see if there are any differences in the services that are running along here. There probably shouldn't be, but sometimes you might find one service is able to get um, faster average speeds than others. So if that is the case, you can kind of look into that, investigate why that might be. So that's corridors. Um, finally, I'll talk about vehicle journeys, which is this menu item here. So this is where I was talking about vehicle replay before. Perhaps you want to look at a particular instance of a single vehicle. Um, you can come in here, search for a particular date. Again, if you have multiple operators, find the operator you're looking for. 
and the service um, that you're interested in as well. We'll load up all of the trips that we have data for. So this actually has four different service patterns, essentially, four different routes that the, the vehicle runs along. And then it's going to load up each trip um, that we have data for. If you click on one of these trips, um, you'll be able to see um, that page that you saw a screenshot of earlier. Um, and over on the left, we're going to show each stop along this trip. Um, the scheduled in, uh, time that we were expecting departures at each stop and then the actual time. And if you hover over that actual time, you'll see the sort of calculated delay. So this started its trip four minutes um, late and it got slightly later throughout the trip um, and became uh, late six minutes, 19 over that six minute threshold at, at this um, fifth stop here. Um, you can see all this on the map on the left. This is telling us where this vehicle went. Um, and you can zoom into the map to see these little um, grey dots, which tell us exactly where we receive GPS updates. Um, so that's uh, quite useful to just kind of double check if you, if you feel you need to. The performance that we've recorded at each stop, so the departure here at 3.38, at this stop, you can see that we received a GPS update at 3.38, the next one at 3.39, just a bit further on from that. So that gives you some confidence that, that this data is quite accurate. Um, and you can follow this route uh, exactly where this vehicle went. Um, and what you can see here in this example is the vehicle should have continued down this road here um, for these three stops. Um, but instead, the vehicle chose a different route, and that's probably because there was a disruption along there. Um, but that starts to give you some more information about exactly what happened on this trip. Perhaps if you're answering any questions from passengers um, or you just want to see how uh, the data relates to the performance that you're seeing. Um, and you can see the knock on effect with journeys that are either previous to this or next to this. So you can click on the next journey, for example, that will load up the next journey and you can see exactly what happened on that journey. For fortunately, there was enough a leeway in the between the two trips for the vehicle to get back on time, but it's still taking this um, sort of diversion um, around the intended route um, here as well. So that gives you some quite granular information about what we're seeing in the data that we're being provided with. Now I'll just switch back to the presentation. Um, so just a bit more about items we're working on right now. Um, so Within some of the reports, you're going to see uh, in on some occasions the completeness of the data might be a bit low. Um, so, as we saw, as I mentioned earlier, we can um, in a lot of cases achieve over 90% data completeness, but we do need consistent and high quality data um, to do that. Uh, we're also making some changes to the service that's what we're hoping is going to improve this further as well. Um, sometimes you might see higher early departures. Than expected again we're making some improvements this month it's based on feedback that we that we got last year um, that will help improve this further and finally um, at large stations again we're seeing some early departures recorded that maybe shouldn't have been um, we're using a 25 meter stop radius in other software and other suppliers um, you can change this definition and this is something that we're currently discussing uh, with dft as well um, as a potential area for improvement so yeah, as I mentioned, those two um, changes, hopefully to provide more complete data set for everyone to use and also to enhance the precision for those departure metrics at stop. So we're making these changes at the end of January. Um, so within the next week, um, so I'd invite everyone to sort of log in if you haven't already or if you have before and you want to see the changes to, to kind of log in again and um, run through some of those examples that, that we worked on just now. Um, most importantly, if you need an invite um, and if you'd like to be invited um, and you're, or you have just any questions about accessing the ABOD, perhaps you've accessed it before and, and you can't remember how to, to get access to it, please drop us an email, support at etoworld.com. Uh, Faisal and team will, will sort this out for you um, as quickly as possible. If you do already have access and you'd like to invite other people in your organisation, um, then in that left sidebar at the bottom, you'll see a, a button to invite a new user. You click on this, a form will come up, drop an email in there from somebody within your organization and they will get an invite to, to join you as well. Um, so hopefully uh, we can get everyone sorted with access uh, to ABOD as well. Um, 
before I open up to the questions, um, we have another webinar coming up in a few weeks time. Uh, I think it's February the 15th. Um, we're then going to go through a bit more of a te technical um, webinar, but we want to talk through the methodology that we use to match the data um, and also calculate departures to departure times from this. So if you have any questions about how that's done, if you're interested in that or perhaps if a colleague um, might be interested in that, please mention this to them and you can sign up um, via the RTIG website. Um, if at any time you have questions before then, please contact us at support at etoworld.com and, and we'll get those questions answered. So yeah, I just want to open up uh, to, to questions now, if we have any. Thank you everyone for listening. Yeah, we do have a few um, in the chat and uh, Q&A part. I wonder, Dan, if you could um, briefly talk about, so someone asked a question about in rural situations where we've had scenarios where low GPS uh, quality and um, so some stops we've been unable to make a prediction for how the interpolation will help fill in those those gaps um, um, yeah. yeah so so in rural locations some sometimes we are noticing that the the location information isn't of the best quality um if we do have enough information on the route around stops um we will use some interpolation to, to fill in some of this data where we where we're confident about doing it um, but it is it is an issue that we're discussing with DFT at the moment about these sort of rural areas, how we can sort of increase the completeness of the data there and, and the accuracy. So I guess it is it is a known issue, um, but but we do our best where we can to, to provide some information for those routes. Cool. Uh, we have another question from Richard. Uh, do you have any particular standards or format in which operators are supposed to publish the data? Uh, and for non-compliant operators, do you normally chase for the data? Um, if, if this is a question around the data that's provided to the Bus Open Data Service, um, there are particular formats that are needed. So one of those is trans exchange for the timetables. Um, and the other one is Siri VM for vehicle location information. Both of those also have their own profiles. So of all the options and all the fields that you could supply, there are specific ones that we recommend supplying and also using them in particular ways. Um, so perhaps it's something we might touch on in the next webinar, exactly how to get the best out of those things in order to produce um, really good analysis. Um, but yeah, essentially, if if those data, data sets aren't being provided, um, it's likely that an operator will, would, would be contacted at some point to, to help with that. Thanks, Dan. Um, another question. Um, what is the bus stop location based on um, as they found some differences between ABOD data and service provider data when comparing data sets? Um, so, I mean, we take the stops, the rep where we have the kind of accurate references from the NAPTAN database. So, um, Hopefully the, those two, the NAPTAN and ABOD, do agree. If they don't, then please please drop us a, a support request and we can look into it. Um, but but generally, if if the identifier that we get in the trans exchange allows us to identify a NAPTAN point, we'd be using the data from NAPTAN. Cool. Um, another question from Baskar. Uh, in creation of a corridor, how do you overcome if subsequent stop is not listed for example not shown in pop-up uh, add further stops i'm not sure if you can see that question dan um i can't i can't but you can't um, it, it would be useful if perhaps you could send that one through to our support team it, yeah. it may be that there's an issue but it's like it's likely that we're basing those suggestions on um journeys that we can see in the trans exchange data on bods bods so if those journeys aren't in the schedule for whatever reason, perhaps they haven't been provided, um, then that won't be an option for you to select because we wouldn't have any data for it anyway. Um, so that's one possible reason. That may not be the reason in this case. So if you don't think that is the reason, then please please send us uh, an email to the support team and we'll, we'll look into that. I'll leave a comment with our email. I think it's worth noting when you are creating a corridor, um, the stops that it suggests are stops which fall 
valid service patterns or valid routes. So it's looking at what routes exist um, that out there and it will suggest s subsequent stops. So what you need to set up is essentially a sequence of stops that forms a, a valid route. And um, so make sure you, you're setting up a corridor um, with a route in, in mind um, through it and then you'll get metrics returned. Cool. Um, another question uh, we have, what is the frequency of data shared on schedules, timetables, GPS location and AVL? Um, I'm not sure how to exactly answer that question. I guess we're, we're expecting and, and BODS expects that the frequency of vehicle location data is that we'll get an update every 30 seconds or less um, from a vehicle. So that is sort of a minimum requirement for us from the vehicle location side to, to create some data. The more frequent that that can be, the more accurate the analysis will ultimately be. Um, in terms of schedule information, um, that should that should be provided um, if you're going to make changes, should be provided in advance of those changes. So we have the latest timetable information. I think there are some requirements on the BOD side. I, I'm not sure I can um, repeat them um, right here because I'd need to look them up, um, but essentially providing that timetable information in, in advance of those changes so we have it and can match to the correct schedules. One of the things you can see on one of the reports in ABODS is the frequency of the average frequency of updates uh, for vehicles on a particular route. So, um, you know, perhaps if you've got an operator that's not providing very frequent updates and that's maybe a cause of, of problems you can have that conversation but you can see that average and just browsing around it seems that the average update frequency at the moment is less than every 20 seconds yep. a couple of years ago when we first started out it was much closer to 30 so uh, a lot of ticket machines are providing updates more frequently than they used to which is good news for an analysis point of view. Cool. Uh, we have another question from Jeff. Uh, is there a natural bias towards city locations to the detriment of rural services as there is no clear movement to improve rural location data? Um, it's probably not a question. That question is probably not one for me. It's probably um, one for someone at DFT or perhaps Tim may have some information about it. Well, what, one of the the challenges in rural locations is the mobile phone signal is uh, much patchier. You know, you will go through sections uh, of route, particularly in uh, hilly uh, areas where you've got you know valleys and things like that. You won't always get mobile phone signal. That's not something that's particularly something that even the DFT can deal with. Um, I fear that it might get worse um, in some areas as the 3G switch off by mobile networks uh, happens. You know, certainly in some of the areas that I uh, travel around in, I'm seeing uh, slightly worse signal uh, than than did before, where there aren't any 3G services anymore. So um, it is something that actually Arctic has had some conversations with. Um, with government departments that like Ofcom that look after uh, mobile uh, coverage and, and the rules around what mobile operators can and can't do. But it's very much a commercial decision rather than anything for, for network operators, rather than anything that uh, that's particularly in control of government. Um, and so um, they if you know of particular black spots which are causing problems, then sometimes you can see uh, particular uh, mobile phone operators uh, adding in uh, base stations and things like that. I know some places have been successful with that, so uh, it's worth tackling at that level. Um, and it's unfortunate that, you know, th there's less market forces in rural areas to, to improve the coverage sometimes. Um, but uh, put pressure on uh, where and how you can. 
Uh, Jeff has his hand up. Uh, go for it. Yeah, you should be able to. We can't hear you, Jeff, if you're trying to talk. OK, while we're waiting for Jeff Sings, there's no other uh, questions. A couple of times uh, Dan referred to future sessions. We've got a number of sessions planned over the next few months. Uh, the next one is middle of February uh, on the logic and improvements. And um, uh, we might want to have a think about the order of this, given the question about data quality. Um, that was uh, scheduled for May, so we might play around with the order of these. But uh, each one goes into uh, the the detail of, of what's been covered today. Um, and today's been very much a taster overview. Uh, session of what a, of everything that ABODs can do um, and so uh, to have some more time to, to dig into each of these and exactly how they work that's the plan over the next few months um, so um, yeah feel free to uh, join you'll be able to uh, to join uh, and uh, access those through the RTIG uh, website and um, we'll be advertising these as they as they come up through all the normal channels so you should get it through cpt as well if you're an operator and um uh, if you're a member of um one of the um uh, bodies like atco or something like that then they push out the adverts for us as well so you should get to uh, to hear about them through that route have we got anything else No. OK, in which case, um, thank you for your time this afternoon. A few upcoming um, things. So if you want to know more about um, ABOD and the previous sessions that have been run over the last couple of years, uh, all the recordings and slides are available uh, on the RTIG website. Uh, there's quite a pile of them now. Um, We've got a couple more events coming up. We've got an online session in 1st of February looking at enhanced partnerships and uh, the information for the passenger. Uh, we've got a face to face uh, on 13th February looking at how you can use AI to improve bus services. This is face to face. Uh, we've got ITO, we've got uh, professors of AI coming to, uh, to help uh, tell us what it's all about and demystify some of it um and uh, and a number of other uh, speakers as well um and then um one focusing on presenting information to passengers in the middle of march that's probably in leicester just waiting for things to uh, come up with so that's all about display screens and uh online information and accessibility and, and that sort of thing so a number of events coming up that you might be interested in um if you want to know more about the work of Artig, contact details are on the screen. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dan, Faisal and Liam for your uh, work this lunchtime, helping educate us on ABODs um, and look forward to uh, seeing you again uh, in the next session in the middle of February. And thank you, everybody, for your time and your questions this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you for watching this RTIG webinar. To find out more about RTIG and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.